Hello everybody, Joey here from the Chart Guys. My name in the Slack room is Jungle Funk. I've been learning under Dan for six years, trading full time for six years, and I'm excited to bring another webinar to you guys. So this is going to be the fourth and final part of the successive series that I've been working on with the goal of essentially having it be most everything you need to know to operate in this game. So thank you all for joining me. And this is this is going to be a bit of a doozy. So it certainly plays off of the other three. Like I said, it's a successive series. So I'm not going to be talking in detail about what we went over in the other ones because we're on to the next stage of it. So if anything's not making sense, go back, watch those other ones, and that'll be that. So stoked to get into it. Let's see. We got Brandon. Thanks for coming. Uh, Dan likes pets. Hello, sir. Dlee Crypto, my pleasure. Excited to have you here. What up, Rav? What up, E.R. Berg? Let's get on into it. Looks like uh, we got sound. We got stream. All right, let's 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 go. Let's do it. So got our webinar outline here. We're going to do a little intro, a little brief uh, reflection on the previous three. Then we're going to get right into the correlation stuff. What causes correlations? How do we identify them? What do we do with this information? We're going to talk about using ratio charts to quantify relative strength and weakness. We're then going to talk about how to implement this into our trading. Got a bunch of examples that we're going to go through, and then we'll wrap it up with some QA. So I'm going to turn off the face cam here to save some real estate. Just wanted you to see who was chatting with you. Let's get on into it. Face cam, goodbye. And the wrap up from the other two. So this was the first webinar, multiple time frame analysis, essentially taking into account the full picture of the market to best calculate probabilities on any given trade. And this operates on the notion that the market moves in fractals. So from that first webinar, we had our trend identification guide. We've got our trend change checklist and nested time frame relationships of the whole two minute nested in with the 15 minute, five minute nested in the hourly, etc. So, and this all is based on peaks and troughs of these pivots. You got all your peaks, you got all your troughs. Where those are in relation to each other is what gives you your trends. And that's what you plug into the multiple time frame analysis element and move on from there. So that is this webinar here. It is on our YouTube channel, live webinar on utilizing different time frames. Um, so I'm seeing in here in the chat from Topher, will there be a playlist? These are all in the lessons and more playlist on our uh, YouTube channel. So moving on to the second webinar, it was all about identifying most likely scenarios using retracement sizes and follow through magnitude. And this is essentially working with our fibs, knowing that if we pull back only to the 382, that favors continuation. If you're between the 382 and 0.5, that's the tweener zone where you could go to higher highs, you could set a lower high. And then if you are down below the 0.5, then that favors a lower high. Just the opposite for the downside. If you only bounce to the 382, it favors lower lows, etc. So that is identifying most likely scenarios, again, on the YouTube channel in that playlist. And then we had the third webinar, which was a little less than a month ago, and this was all on entry techniques. So we've got our patterns here, our bottom fish, falling wedge, inverse head and shoulders, stair step, and just a simple trend change, just the opposite to the downside here. And that was the webinar from September 28th. So it is on our YouTube as best trading entry strategies. So let's get on into the new stuff. So talking about market correlations, um, essentially market correlations are names trading in a similar fashion to each other. So pretty, pretty simply. And what causes these correlations, a big part of it is algorithmic trading. You know, this ain't your grandpappy stock market and a lot of volume in the markets these days is from bots and algos. And it's estimated that 60 to 75% of trading volume is alg algorithmic. I didn't say that right, <laughs> algorithmic. So that is one element to it. And then the other element is trader sentiment, because if an individual trader sees, say, the S&P 500 looking strong, then they'll have more confidence to go ahead and try to play 
something like Apple or NVDA or, or really any name uh, to the upside. So you've got sentiment and then you've got algos. And the combination of these two things is what helps keep the market kind of synced up. And we'll see correlations span across things that are completely unrelated. Um, you know, this recent period for Bitcoin, it's certainly been doing its own thing and fending off broad market correlations. Um, but, you know, if you told somebody that Bitcoin correlates with the S&P 500, there's still a lot of people out there that think that that is just pure hogwash. But you can look at the charts and see that the peaks and troughs of these moves happen roughly around the same time often. Again, it's not happening currently, but the, the correlations can span across assets, whether they're related or not. And then and even in a step further is, say, Netflix has earnings and it bombs its earnings, and then that's pulling down the S&P 500. Well, that can pull down Bitcoin. And, you know, obviously Bitcoin has nothing to do with Netflix, but just the nature of how the market works, this is, this is what you get. So let's see, how do we identify correlations? It's going to be all about the peaks and troughs and determining if these are happening at roughly the same time. So you've got direct correlations and then you've got inverse correlations. So direct correlations are things are moving roughly together in the same direction. And then inverse would just be the opposite, where when one name's going up, the other name's going down. And then within that, there's variance. You can have a tick to tick correlation where, um, you know, every peak and trough is at the same minute uh, because they're so tightly correlated. And then you can have a looser correlation where it's just the general sentiment is moving in the same direction, but the smaller time frames have leeway to do their own things within there. So let's just pop over to TradingView real quick here to have a look at how to identify some correlations. So looking at ES futures here and then uh, NQ futures. So the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. And these are very closely correlated names. And you can see, if we look at our crosshairs here, the peaks, this peak here, roughly the same time. We go down, we look at our trough down here, and you see the, the crosshair moving over here. You know, the trough, roughly the same time. Peak, same time, trough, same time. You get the you get the picture. So if you if you've got a name and you're wondering like is this correlated to the S and P 500? Is this correlated to XLF? Whatever. Pull up your charts and analyze your peaks and troughs. If you if you're pivoting at roughly the same times, you've got a correlated name. So that's that's a, a direct correlation and and a tick for tick one at that. And then we can take a look at an inverse correlation. So this is gold in the orange and green and then we've got the dollar in these little bars here and this is uh not only an inverse correlation but a a loose correlation so we can look in here and see where'd that go so our our peak on the dollar is a or our peak on gold is a trough in the dollar we can come in here a little bit closer like look at this current action the trough on the dollar is the peak on gold the peak on the dollar isn't quite a trough on gold, and that's why this is a, a looser correlation and kind of a tougher one to utilize, but peak on gold, trough on the dollar, trough on gold, peak on the dollar, that is an inverse relationship. So getting back to the slides here, moving on, where do we typically see these correlations? You can see them with an individual name, uh, correlating to its corresponding ETF. So whether you're talking about Bank of America correlating to XLF, or you're talking about Tesla correlating with QQQ, that is that uh, version of the correlational relationship. Then you can have an individual name correlating to the S&P 500. Then you can have a sector ETF correlating to the S&P 500. So that would be like XLF, uh, correlating to SPY. And then we'll also see names correlate based on their risk assessment within the market. So you can see high risk assets correlate to other high risk assets, despite not really having any fundamental um, relationship there. So an example of that would be like how we see growth names correlate with the small cap names from IWM. So Another correlation, you got Bitcoin correlating with uh, QQQ and SPY, 
And then another common one is alt altcoins correlating with Bitcoin. So it's important to know the framework that you're within and what names your sectors or uh, chart is correlating with. So moving on here, getting into the juice. What is a bullish correlation? So we've got multiple signs of a bullish correlation. One is when you've got one name holding support and another name has gone to lower lows. Another is when you have one name breaking resistance and the other is still below. Next, we've got when one name has a shallow retracement and the other has deep retracement. And the next is when we have one name that has a strong bounce and another that has a weak bounce. So we'll certainly go over these with some examples, but just to do a little doodling around here on trading view, let's see, we can draw some lines and look at these. So if we've, if this is what one name is doing here, and we have a correlated name that is looking like this, bit of a bigger move up, less retracement, stronger move up, less retracement, that's a bullish correlation there. So just, just a, a quick example of, of what we're what I'm talking about with evaluating these retracement sizes, these follow-through magnitudes. And, and that ultimately is what this all is. So getting back to the slides here, we can talk about a bearish correlation, and it's ultimately the opposite. So signs of bearish correlations when we have one name going to lower lows while the other is still holding support. When we've got one name failing to break resistance while another already has. When we've got one name that has deep retracement while another has shallow. And when one name has a weak bounce while another has a strong bounce. So we can go back over here to trading view just to kind of visualize one example of the opposite side of things. If this is the S&P 500 and say we are in an EQ here and then we've got QQQ and it is not in an EQ and it is in a downtrend. You know, our peaks and troughs are still at the same time, but the fact that QQQ over here is going to lower lows, that is a bearish correlation. So getting back to the slides, moving on, in a nutshell, correlational TA is using comparative analysis between two or more names and evaluating all of our standard TA metrics, our trends, our retracement size, our follow through magnitude. And that's why this is the, the final of the four part series because it hinges on the information in these other three. You can't really utilize correlations effectively if your foundations are not rock solid. So moving on here, what the heck do we do with this information? Simply put, you play the strong names bullish and you play the weak names bearish. And when we do this, we have increased odds of success on any given trade because we have additional market wins at our back. So this is the, the standard and um, you know classical, easy way to go about utilizing this information. It's straightforward and it increases odds of success on any given trade. But it's not the only way you can go about doing it. If you're a bit more of a deacon, you can go for the high risk, higher reward option, which is the opposite of what was on the previous slide of playing the strong names bearish and the weak names bullish. So this, there's a reason it's the high risk, high reward option. It is an advanced approach with lower probabilities of success, but greater reward if it's pulled off. So certainly if, if you're new to using correlations, you don't necessarily want to be trying to wrangle these types of trades right out the gate because it is a, a lot more difficult because essentially you're swimming against the current anticipating that the river is going to magically start going the other way. And it does at times, it, eventually it, it almost always does. Uh, but pegging that shift can be very difficult. So there's a few ways that we can help peg these shifts. The number one cause for a shift in relative strength or weakness is a hold of a key level. So if you've got a name that comes down, in double bottoms, you know, it's got relative weakness, it's coming down to support, and then it double bottoms and turns around, that you will very often see relative weakness shift to relative strength at that moment. And if you just think about the psychology of it, 
you you've got a bunch of traders that see the support level they go in they play off of the support level meaning they're buying that's where you get your relative strength and then once that support level holds then you've got another tranche of traders that say oh well that support level held now i'm gonna buy and then once you confirm your first uptrend then you've got another tranche of traders that come in and then it just kind of snowballs out all from a key support hold or a resistance rejection so that's one way to try to peg the shifting tides. The other way is with ratio charts. So when you've got your ratio chart and you know on the next slide we'll get into what these are, but essentially you can apply TA to your ratio chart and that can help you pinpoint where this shift is going to come. So for example, um, let's let's go back to trading view here. If if your ratio chart is doing this, it's an uptrend. Well, uh, on this pullback here, you know, this is relative weakness for the name because the ratio chart's going down. But if you are, say, riding, I don't know if this is gonna show up here. Oh, it will. Say you're riding the 12 EMA on the daily. Well, you've got a few days of relative weakness, but you know, because you're looking for a higher low, that there's potential that the, these tides turn and you end up looking bull when the ratio chart gets to its key location and and that can help you peg this shift so to to get into what are ratio charts it's ultimately a chart that plots the quotient of two names so for example that would be a chart where you're typing in qqq divided by spy and it's actually um, dividing all of the qqq inputs by the spy inputs for the specific times when those inputs printed. And then it charts out that data. So when a ratio chart is going up, the name in the numerator has relative strength and vice versa. When it's going down, the name in the denominator has relative strength. And the craziest thing about these ratio charts is that technical analysis applies to the ratio charts independently. So you will see the trend changes. You will see support holds, resistance rejections, you will see EMA riders, all of the things that we see on our regular stock charts or futures charts or crypto charts you see on these ratio charts. So it's really kind of a mind warper when uh, you, you try to think about it too much because and, and it really just highlights the complexities of the market. So moving on here, we've got two types of relative strength and weakness. So if your ratio chart is going up, you know that the name in the numerator has relative strength. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going up more than the other name. That's, that's the preferred form of relative strength when chart one is going up more than chart two. But you've got to be cognizant that it can also mean that chart one is going down less than chart two. So that's for relative strength and for relative weakness. The example would be chart one going down more than chart two. That's your standard relative weakness, but you've always got to watch out that the ratio chart is going down simply because chart one is going up less than chart two. And it's important to identify which scenario you're dealing with because you can be positioned in a, you can be positioned bull in a relatively strong name, but if it's still going down, you still lose money. So it, you, you've got to determine, is this ratio chart going up because the name I'm trying to play bullish is going up more than the name that it is being compared to. So odds increase for being on the right side of this division if the chart driving the correlation, whether it be SPY, QQQ, Bitcoin, if that's seeing its most likely scenario play out and that's seeing the move play out that you're looking for. So if you are trying to play QQQ bullish because it's got relative strength compared to SPY, well, you need to see SPY also start to go up. It's, it's very rare to see QQQ going up and SPY going down. So you could have your QQQ SPY ratio going up, showing relative strength there, but it's just because it's dropping less than SPY. So if SPY gets its most likely scenario, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the most likely scenario, there's nuances to it, but if you're looking for a QQQ bounce, you need SPY to bounce along with it if that ratio is what is driving you to take the play. So positioning based on ratio charts. 
while pegging the flip from relative strength to relative weakness and vice versa is higher risk, higher reward with lower probability of success. If we take into account most likely scenarios on the ratio charts, the probabilities become a lot less daunting. And what this means would be positioning bullish in QQQ on a test of the weekly 12 EMA in the QQQ SPY ratio. Uh, another example could be positioning bearish in a name when its ratio chart has the potential for a double top. So again, it's, it's high risk, high reward, and it's difficult with low probability of success to go for these shifts in relative strength and relative weakness. But if you're not going blind and you're utilizing these ratio charts, it really, really shifts the odds for being able to nail these rotations from relative weakness to relative strength. So while the ratio chart is what gets us interested, the most or most of the time, we need two things for the trade to work out optimally. We need a setup that fits within your tickers, most likely scenario, and we need the ticker that is driving the correlation to see its most likely scenario play out or just see its move play out. So you can't just see the ratio coming down and testing the daily 12 EMA and then just YOLO into it because you're anticipating relative strength to come or something like that. You see the ratio coming down to daily 12 EMA, and this is just a hypothetical example. And then you zoom in to the name that you're actually trading. And then you look and you see, do I have one of my tools? Do I have a stair step? Do I have an inverse head and shoulders? Do I have a tightening range? You know, any of those things. And that's what you base your risk on because you can't just enter one name and then hope that the ratio chart does one thing and, and you know, it's tougher to manage risk. So you need a setup on your individual name. All right, and when this is not the case, meaning that uh, you're not actually getting the most likely scenario on the, the ticker driving the correlation, then stair steps are a great tool to use. And this is, this is often the case when we've got ratio divergences. So that would mean, uh, well, I think this is the next slide. Yeah, so ratio divergences, uh, essentially a bullish ratio divergence is when the ratio chart is holding a higher low while the underlying goes to a lower low. So if you're trying to play this, um, it can be difficult because the chart that you're playing off of just broke support. It went to lower lows, but you know it's got relative strength because the ratio chart is holding a higher low. And if you're going to try to essentially nail a bottom on the ticker that you're playing just after breaking support, a good way to do that is a stair step or a smaller time frame trend change something like that. You want to just make sure that you have a level to play off of because if we're if we're looking at this, th this is actually just from an RSI divergence uh, sheet, but it's ultimately the same thing. So if we've got bullish divergence here, this is the ratio chart holding the higher low and the chart you're playing is going to the lower low. So you, you could have a situation where this can pull all the way down to here and still be holding a higher low. Well, if the chart you're playing plummets all the way down to here in the span of the ratio chart going down to there, then you, you're probably not going to make money on the trade. So we got to be tight with the risk when we're trying for these divergences. So that's the standard divergence. Um, another version of the divergence is when the ratio chart breaks resistance while the underlying has yet to do so. So that tells you that you've got relative strength your ratio chart is confirming its trend change or breaking resistance, and it's kind of front running the underlying ticker. Um, and that can lead you to anticipate that the underlying ticker will follow. So bearish ratio divergence is just the opposite. When the ratio chart is holding a lower high while the underlying goes to a higher high, or when the ratio chart breaks support while the underlying has yet to do so. So here's the bearish divergence. We have a higher high on our name we're playing but a lower high on the ratio. And when that happens, it tells you to be skeptical. You want to, when you have most confidence in something is when your ratio chart is making the move along with the chart that you're actually playing. And again, stair steps are a great tool to use when playing divergences. Anytime that you're trying to play like a lower low without follow through, ratio charts are a great way to, or not ratio charts, stair steps are a great way to do it because it can be tough to manage risk. You know, where do you put your stop? if you're looking to buy after losing support. 
you know, you could just say, oh, well, I'll give it 0.2% or something, but that is ultimately arbitrary, and we can zoom in and use clues on smaller time frames to try to pinpoint these things when we have a reason to be doing it, and that reason would be the ratio chart. So how do we implement this into our trading? Uh, we have the, the simple approach that we talked about in the beginning, playing strong names bullish, weak names bearish. Um, another way to go about using these correlational clues is, is using clues from the technicals on a correlated name to make moves on a different ticker. So what I mean by this, uh, we'll go through this example. If QQQ is relatively strong, if you're in QQQ, oh, let me lay out the scene a little bit. Say we're playing an hourly bounce. You know, things have been dumping. We're looking for an hourly oversold bounce. You get in QQQ and everybody's bouncing. Well, if QQQ has clear relative strength and you want to be aggressive, you could say, okay, well, typically QQQ hourly 12 EMA would be my target. But because QQQ has this relative strength and everybody else is bottoming, maybe I'll wait for SPY to get to its hourly 12 EMA. Um, and that would then have QQQ getting well above its hourly 12 EMA. So that would be the aggressive approach to using this relationship. Another way you could go about it is say you are in SPY and QQQ has this relative strength and you know it's not looking as great for SPY and you want to be a bit more conservative, you can say, okay, well, when QQQ gets to its hourly 12 EMA test, I'm going to go ahead and sell my SPY because, you know, it's not looking as good right now. So, you know, those are two different sentiments because you have one being conservative, one being aggressive, and that's always going to be the case in trading. When you're evaluating, how do you want to go about doing this? What decisions do you want to make? Like we have all of this information, it's given to us every day, uh, but then you have to decide, do I want to be aggressive? Do I want to be conservative? Am I bullish? Am I bearish? And you slot into wherever you decide within there. And that is how you go about it. Because, you know, a con conservative QQQ bull on this bounce, they might say, oh, well, I don't want to be aggressive and, and figure that SPY is going to get up to hourly 12 EMA, because what if it doesn't? What if QQQ hourly 12 EMA tops it? So you're just taking profit at the QQQ hourly 12 EMA. And the, the same could be painted for, say, an aggressive bear could say, okay, well, I think QQQ hourly 12 EMA is gonna top us. SPY's not even close. I'm gonna short SPY when QQQ gets to its hourly 12 EMA. So that's one way to go about implementing this into your trading. Um, another is letting the ratio chart determine when we are looking bullish or bearish on a name. So, like I said, these ratio charts, the standard TA patterns apply to them the same way that they do on regular charts. So, like, if you see an equilibrium on a ratio chart, you know that when that equilibrium breaks, then we're going to have relative strength or relative weakness come into this name, likely to stay for a little bit. Just as when we have a equilibrium on a regular chart, when that breaks, you know, the tighter it gets, when it breaks, we anticipate follow through. So... You, when you get this follow through, it's not, you know, on necessarily the name you're playing, but that tells you we have relative strength. So then if you're looking to play bull, you want to be playing this name that has the relative strength. Um, and another great tool for it are the EMA rider plays. These ratio charts will ride EMAs the same way a regular chart does. And you can use that for timing entries. You can use that for knowing when to take profits, all of that stuff. So... Another element to consider is that if peers get a technical signal, in general, odds increase that your name will eventually get the same signal. So we see this in all sorts of different sectors, um, you know, whether it be the uranium space, when one name starts a weekly bounce, it's likely that the other major miners are going to do the same. If one name starts monthly consolidation, it's likely that the other majors are going to do the same. We're seeing it in the broad market right now with um, quarterly lower highs getting set one by one across major players in the market. Uh, so this, this happens all the time and it's important to pay attention to what are my correlated peers doing because you can get an edge from them to bring into what you're doing with your name. So an, another more nuanced element of this 
is you can lower probabilities on directional patterns if there's clear opposing relative strength or relative weakness. So what I mean by that, uh, probably just easiest to talk about the example. If we've got a rising wedge on a name that is much stronger than its peers, this is often an instance where the name is waiting for its peers to join versus that name having independent exhaustion. So, um, yeah, I just realized I forgot to get the example for that. Uh, there was a good one, and, and we'll just we'll just go ahead and pull it up while we're talking about it now. Let's go here. We'll look at IVN. IVN. Where is it here? On the TSX it is a copper miner. And where was it? It was back in here. We had this. Is that where it was? Yeah. We had this kind of rising wedge shaping up on IVN. But it was it was way stronger. Hmm, what rising wedge is that? I didn't realize I had stuff drawn on it. This was a rising wedge that did end up playing out. Let me get rid of these lines. So we had you know, we'll draw it something like that. You know, not perfect. But had this rising wedge, you know, higher highs not seeing follow through, higher highs not seeing follow through. Is this a red flag? Well, it was so much stronger than its peers that we were able to say. That, okay, the odds of this rising wedge breaking bear are low because it's the the peers are, are weaker now. And if the peers get their act together, then IVN is poised to break this rising wedge bullish. So it's certainly a more nuanced uh, implementation of, of this information, but it's just an example of kind of how this puzzle that is the market, you know, there's so many pieces, so many things to consider and we can take all of these little clues and help us shift our odds on all of this stuff. So let's see, what do we got next? When a name, when the name driving the correlation drops to lower lows and your name is holding support, there's opportunity for a low risk bottom fish. And this is, this is probably the most common implementation and simplest implementation of this, this correlational information. So, Another very important part, just working with correlations and rotation in general, is, is it helps us determine whether we are in a rotational or a unified trending environment. And this plays into the all major sectors at high of day, low of day signal that Dan talks about a lot. You know, if we've got XLF going up, QQQ going down, you, we know that we've got rotation on the day and there's greater odds of balance and, and all of that stuff. But if we have all of our majors going to new high of day, same time, trending together, then that's when we know it's a very strong day. We've got money coming into the market that day. So you don't necessarily want to be fading those moves. And, and this is all determined and derived from understanding how do our correlations work, looking around the market. You know, I almost never play XLF, but I always want to know what it's doing because it helps me hone in my odds when I'm playing EFs, NQ, RTY, or YM. So uh, another element and a more advanced element of this is tracking rotation and utilizing historical rotation within market cycles to hone in macro probabilities. So I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but put simply, um, like in crypto, LTC, you know, it changed a little bit this past year. It had a pretty nice move off the bottom, but um, in general, LTC is a very weak coin. It's like the weakest of the bunch. And we would see often that cycles would top when LTC gets its pump. Like when LTC is pumping all on its own, you know that, okay, well, maybe this this current cycle is nearing an end um, because you'll, you'll see money rotate through everything. And then it ultimately ends up getting to the junkers last. And that's kind of where the whole concept of dash to trash comes in like the the junkier names are the last ones to get the pump and if you're tracking all of this rotation once you see your junkers get their pump you know that you've got to potentially be cautious elsewhere so let's see talking about relative strength and relative weakness uh, I, I like to break it down into four categories you've got your confirmed bull You've got your anticipatory bear, you've got your confirmed bear, and your anticipatory bull. And the reason these are grouped together up here, we got the two up here and the two down here, 
is because ultimately a confirmed bull is an anticipatory bear. A confirmed bear is an anticipatory bull. Um, and so to, to get into the details of what they are, confirmed bull has clear relative strength. You've got clear relative strength, you're leading the pack, you're a confirmed bull. Well, why that is also an anticipatory bear is because we see lead bulls turn into lead bears. That happens all the time. It doesn't happen the other way where we see confirm or confirmed lead bears turn into anticipatory bulls. We can't say that that's going to happen with as much confidence because we, we do see names die in the market. We do see coins go to zero. We do see companies go bankrupt. And sometimes you can have something going on that will keep a confirmed bear from being an anticipatory bull. But uh, yeah, with this anticipatory bear, it's clear relative strength that could shift into relative weakness. So I like to scout names in all four of these categories because then whatever the driving correlational name within the market does, you can have your scouts set out to capitalize on that. So, and, and that really is what it all hinges on because if the driving correlational name goes to the upside, then you're looking at your confirmed or anticipatory bulls. If it goes to the downside, you're looking at your confirmed or anticipatory bears. So as I said a little bit earlier, a confirmed bull is simultaneously an anticipatory bear. A confirmed bear is simultaneously an anticipatory bull. Lead bulls eventually turn into lead bears, but not vice versa. Death is always possible. Um, and how we can help determine these anticipatory blaze that comes in from the larger time frame, most likely scenarios on the ratio charts. And, and that can really help us hone in what uh, you know can be seen as a low probability trade, but um, you know it's not. It's it, it's it's not if you're utilizing these ratio charts here. So we'll get into examples of of all of these things, but just going to finish through the slides at the moment, and then we'll go back through and talk about all of these examples. So um, one of my favorite place when talking about how to implement this information into our trading is what uh, I, I only just coined today, the last man standing play. Uh, I've certainly talked about it here in the chart, guys, a good number of times, but uh, you know, figured now that we're bringing it into the webinar, I may as well put a name on it so people can know um, what we're talking about here. So it, it's used with a group of correlated names, and, and my favorite way to play it is with ES, NQ, RTY, and YM. That's the, the SPY, NASDAQ, Russell, and Dow futures. And ultimately what it is, when three of the four names have broken to lower lows, um, and, and this is just a bull, bullish example, when three of the four names have broken to lower lows, there's an opportunity for a low-risk bottom fish of the name that is showing relative strength by not breaking to lower lows yet. And the key element of this is that it's important that the names that have already broken to lower lows are extended to the downside and, quote, due for a bounce. If the weaker names are not due for a bounce, then this becomes a lower probability play, and ultimately you're going to be trying to bottom fish a name that is likely to just follow suit and break support as well. So the benefits of this are that it is low risk, it's straightforward, and it's much easier than trying to get the bottom on these names that have already broken support. So how I hunt these plays is on my side monitor, I've got my correlational charts and I have this quad window that I that I keep open with uh, ES, NQ, RTY, and YM. And you can very clearly see the relative strength, relative weakness, and all of that over there. So on my middle monitor, I've got my main chart, my left monitor, I've got my brokers, and then on the right monitor, I have my Slack and my correlational charts. So let's get into some examples here. Let me pull this back up. And actually, before we get right into this, I got a cat trying to get inside. One second. All right, I'm back. So let's just let's just chug on through these. We did that. We did that. Let's take a look at a bullish correlation. So on the left here, we have the S&P 500 futures. On the right, we have the NASDAQ futures. And again, if we use the crosshairs to sync up the times, 
if we look at this resistance here, and then we, we pull on down and we bounce. Well, the S&P 500 doesn't even really come close to that resistance. If we look at the NASDAQ, it clears it. So that is relative strength there. That is relative strength, and then we can see uh, another version of relative strength or this bullish correlation is that we have ES goes down to lower lows, and the NASDAQ holds a higher low there, uh, ultimately a double bottom. So that is a, a good example here of bullish correlation. So let's see, we've got bullish correlation number two. Same thing, ES over here, NASDAQ over here. ES goes up four hour lower high, lower low, big follow through. If we look at this support down here, that is this support here on the NASDAQ, and NASDAQ forms a higher low because its bounce was a lot stronger. If we look at this resistance here, that is this resistance on NASDAQ, and, and on the move up, we got almost right to it. And on ES, I guess ES got decently close, but before below the 4-hour 12 EMA, it's just a bit weaker, and then it flushes to lower lows, while NASDAQ forms that higher low, bullish correlation. So moving on here, and this is this is the um, that easiest, most simple implementation of utilizing relative strength, relative weakness, bullish correlation, in our trading, we're looking at Link USD compared to Bitcoin here. And this was just a few days ago on Thursday. And essentially, we've got Bitcoin pulling back. It's nearing hourly oversold conditions, seeing some pretty good flush down here. And on this leg down, you know, if we if we look right here, there's not much of a difference. Um, you know, we get a little bit lower on on uh, Link here uh, where Bitcoin held the low. Then we bounce back up and then we pull back down here. And this is where we know that we've got a bullish correlation here because Bitcoin flushes down to lower lows. It's almost at hourly oversold. Link is holding support here. You can simply just say, all right, I'm going to buy Link and I'm going to put my stop below the low. It's low risk. If Bitcoin gets its hourly bounce underway, then Link is positioned well for upside. And that is what we ended up seeing there. So let's move on. And here we're going to go through some last man standing examples. So this one is back from, let's see, August 2022 or October 2022. And essentially, we've, we're have we looking at the weekly charts. We got ES, NQ, RTY, YM, and ES moved down to lower lows. NQ, big bounce up, moved down to lower lows. YM, big bounce up, moved down to lower lows. Well, RTY was not down at lower lows. It was it was still above support. We're oversold on these other indices. At the time, we're testing four month, 12 EMAs. There's reason to think that we could see some upside from here. And you have an opportunity to bottom fish RTY with very low risk and basically get in at the bottom there. So that's that's one way to go about it if you're looking to play it. But the other way to go about it is say you are bearish you say, okay, well, we need this last man standing to fall if we're going to see continued downside here. And time and time again, you will see the last man standing uh, stick a foot in the ground, and that ends up marking the bottoms for these other names. So there's a couple ways you can go about it. You can just take the RTY bottom fish there at that point, or you could say, okay, well, I'm going to enter NQ while RTY, <coughs> excuse me, while RTY tests its low. And if RTY breaks to new lows, then I'll stop out of NQ. So that is one example of this last man standing play. <clears throat> the other example was very recently here. Same charts, except we are on the daily now. We've got ES, bear flag confirmed. And this is into daily oversold conditions. This is while we're testing monthly 12 EMA. There is some reason to look bullish here. We've got RTY, been relatively weak. Lower lows big time follow through. And we've got YM, lower lows, big time follow through. Well, look, look how extended YM is here. We, we've got RSI nearing 20. Um, we, we've got plenty of reason to think that there could be a bounce, but it's going to be a lot harder to try to peg ES, RTY, YM. Well, we've got NQ. We knew it had the relative strength because this is the same as this example here. This, this ultimately was the last man standing play, this bullish correlation uh, that we were talking about with QQQ. 
we saw the stronger bounce and then we're coming back and then ultimately it is our last man standing right here and we can look at this a couple ways we can say all right if i'm trying to play this bounce here my odds are a lot higher of playing nq and you can bottom fish it or you can say if i'm looking for this market to keep dumping we need to see nq break its daily support so it ended up being a great last man standing play there and that is that so now now we're talking about correlation shifting from bullish to bearish and, and we had a really great example of it on ai here recently um let's see i'm hitting all the wrong buttons how do i make this hmm. i forget the forget the there we go I'm trying to make it full screen here um so we've got a daily tightening range here on um ai we had relative weakness on the way down we hold our support at the low then that shifts to relative strength then we reject right from daily resistance that shifts to relative weakness then we hold the low of the previous day by a penny shifts to relative strength then we reject resistance shifts to relative weakness and if we if we bring back in our correlation to qqq here we can see this clear relative strength after this <coughs> excuse me um after this hold of support down here and we bounce all the way back up to this high and if that were to be the same thing on qqq here's ai's hold of support qqq gets about halfway up to this high ai gets all the way up there then we reject resistance and we have clear relative weakness pulling all the way back it definitely helped that qqq was still weak with it and then we hold support and we have relative strength look at AI bounce all the way back up almost to this resistance. That would be like QQQ here, bouncing all the way back up to here. So clear relative strength. And, and this is that notion that the number one thing that will cause shifts in relative strength and relative weakness is a key support or resistance hold. So we've got another example of it here with RTY. So we're looking at RTY on the left and then our RTY ES ratio on the right, we have been in a monthly EQ for a good while and it's just now trying to break bear. Uh, no follow through yet. But if we look down here at our support hold on RTY, you know, it had had some relative weakness on the way down here. Then we hold support that's here on the ratio chart and it turns into relative strength. Then we get our move up and we reject from resistance. And then that relative strength here on the ratio chart shifts to relative weakness and we come on down and then we hold support again down here and that starts a little shift to some relative strength and then we get our bounce on up we reject, reject from resistance again and then that is right here where we turn over to some relative weakness so this could also be seen as some ratio divergence if we look at this peak here that is here on the ratio chart and then it sees another leg up and then that's a lower high on the ratio so that is bearish ratio divergence and it ended up playing out very nicely as rty has been relatively weak for a good while here so moving on to nq es ratio here on the left and nq here on the right and we can look at this ratio we've been riding weekly 12 ema for a while a little dip below but no follow through and then here we are coming back down to this 12 ema but we know we've had relative weakness for a couple weeks here that's QQQ pulling back harder than Pierce here, but we know this ratio is coming into the 12 EMA. So that tells us that this relative weakness could shift to relative strength. And if we look in on the daily here, here's our bounce from the 12 EMA. And then we know if this is going to hold, we're going to need a bounce. Then we're going to need a higher low and a higher high on the ratio chart to look to set a weekly higher low off of this 12 EMA. Well, if you go ahead and try to position in NQ, as you're looking for this daily higher low on the ratio chart, then you end up getting a really nice position here before a decent move on up. And this is again that same last man standing play that we've used for a couple examples here. Um, that is that relative weakness. The reason we had, or relative strength, I mean, excuse me, the reason we had that relative strength is because this ratio is holding the weekly 12 EMA. And, and these are things that 
you know, it's not just hindsight stuff. Um, most all of these I uh, have traded, and th this NQ one w ended up being a fantastic trade, um, but, and, and that was the reason that I took it, was because of this ratio chart. That, that's what drove the play, and it ended up seeing very nice follow through here to higher highs. So let's see, looking at an EMA rider on a ratio. So we're looking here at CCJ URA. CCJ is the sector leader in the uranium space. URA is the ETF. And you can just look at this ratio and see we're riding the two day 12 EMA for ages. Little pop below, tried, no acceptance, got back up, continued to ride. And we were able to say in the room that as long as the CCJ URA ratio is holding the two day 12 EMA, then CCJ is the place to have your money in the space. As soon as we lose that 12 EMA, then we know that CCJ has fallen from its spotlight and it's no longer the main place that you want your money. There's better place to be had in there. And we'll see these EMA riders play out again and again and again. And the same thing will be said for NQ. When we lose the uh, NQES weekly 12 EMA with conviction, that's going to spell trouble for the market. That's going to spell some downside. So always got to be keeping an eye on these ratio charts. So another ratio chart example of how you can get larger time frame directional clues from patterns on the ratio chart. And this is the 8 BTC ratio chart. We've got a monthly equilibrium, high, higher low, lower high, higher low, lower high, and it tightened on up. And then once it broke bear, ape has been a lead bear ever since. And, and this is, you can't always hope for this type of follow through, but it's it's picture perfect follow through there. So let's see, moving on. And, and this is basically the opposite. This is the URA spy ratio. So that uranium ETF pitted against spy, got a monthly equilibrium here and it broke bear. No follow through, couldn't break through all the levels. And then bulls showed back up and we've had clear relative strength in the uranium space for a while. And if we can get through this resistance and actually break it bull, you know, uranium bulls would are salivating, hoping that they can get this kind of follow through that the eight BTC ratio got breaking bear. They hope they can get that on this ratio chart breaking bull. But, you know, during all of our uranium videos and everything that we were tracking, these, these pivots on the ratio chart ultimately marked the pivots on the charts themselves. And to have just this picturesque EQ, it made navigating the space a lot easier. And if you go back and watch those Uranium Talk videos, you know, one of these bottoms in here, I don't know which one it was, we absolutely drilled and it was the ratio chart that guided that full thing. So let's see, um, this is, you know, un unfortunate. So this is today on Tesla. We're just talking about clear relative weakness here. These wicks are not real, they're all wacky. It kind of makes the chart look wonked up, but that's not what we're here to look. We're here to look at how can we tell we have clear relative weakness right out the gate? So this is the open. We got two little weak five minute candles and then we roll on over. And this is what QQQ is doing. So on the third five minute candle of the day, we're still green. Fourth five minute candle of the day, we're still green. Well on Tesla, those are both red candles. So that tells us we've got some relative weakness here. And we can see how it ended up playing out throughout the day. Just clear relative weakness all day. QQQ bouncing up. You know, we put in our bottom here on QQQ. That's here on Tesla. And then this bounce that doesn't even get us back to what is this high on QQQ. You know, QQQ blows through it and goes up in test high of day. So clear relative weakness. So let's see. Now this is going to be an example of utilizing ratio chart patterns to try to position within the underlying stock. So we're looking at Tesla here. We've got a 12 hour rising wedge. This is back from February, 12 hour rising wedge on the ratio chart. And if you couple that with this head and shoulders on the regular chart, you can get a nice entry there. So I, I didn't end up taking this entry. I ended up waiting for the lower high after it broke down bear, but um, the aggressive trader could have combined this pattern here with this pattern here and had good ammo to go ahead and try to take this short here on Tesla. So uh, another example of it, and this is NVDA, 
we are looking at our NVDA QQQ ratio. We've got a tightening range, you know, like a two day equilibrium here. And there's multiple things to glean from this specific chart. One, we can say that the direction that this breaks is going to have big implications for how NVDA actually trades relative to the market. We've been tightening up for a while now. If it breaks bull, then the blue sky show is likely to continue. If it breaks bear, then we've likely got some deeper consolidation in NVDA. So a couple things. We look at this lower high, you know, great. NVDA has been strong for a while, but we know we're anticipating a lower high up here. Then you can zoom on in. Um, I was originally watching like a maybe a rising wedge here, but after this higher high, it turned into more of a channel. And I knew that if this channel breaks bear, then that is NVDA QQQ likely seeing some two-day consolidation, and we'll see relative weakness in NVDA. And it, it gave me confidence to position short in here as this move was playing on out. And then same thing can be said a couple days ago. We had you know, NVDA, clear relative strength. That That's exciting, right? Yeah, it is exciting, but we can't forget that a lower high is the most likely scenario. And that can help us keep from getting bamboozled saying, all right, well, I'm going to just buy NVDA because it's got clear relative strength. Well, we know the ratio chart is looking to come on down if the most likely scenario plays on out. And that ended up happening. So we'll see what we end up getting from here. But just a good example of using these ratio charts. And we'll have to see when this tightening range breaks, do we get follow through like this on APE BTC? Probably not to this magnitude because this is truly exceptional. But, uh, you know, we got to watch out for it. So moving on, what do we got here? So this is going to be an example of anticipatory or basically setting up looking for a confirmed bull, an anticipatory bear, a confirmed bear, and an anticipatory bull. So this is uh, to kind of talk about what we do in the chart, guys, and, and some of the resources here. This, this was a post from the alt channel. Essentially, um, I had a mentor session where I was uh, helping sitting bull scout and kind of get these concepts down and, you know, uh, posted the video from the uh, session as we scouted these things. And then ultimately we were able to go back through and look at how they all played out. So it's uh, the nice thing about posting in chat is it allows you to go back and see, you know, how is my analysis working? How are these relationships playing on out, but ultimately we got LTC as a confirmed bull, we got Ape and Sand as anticipatory bulls, we had um, Sushi as an anticipatory bear, and then Mana as a confirmed bear or established bear. And we can look at how these things played out. The X was when the scout was, and this was the ratio chart on LTC BTC, and the reason we were looking for it to be an anticipatory bull was because we were riding the daily 12 EMA. Well, yeah, it's been weak for a few days, but that's an anticipatory bull, or, or a confirmed bull, excuse me, because we're riding the 12 EMA. We've been on this move up. So that's your that's your confirmed bull. You're looking for your higher low here. And ultimately, LTC ended up seeing a decent move off from that. And to talk about Ape again, Ape was the anticipatory bull because it's been weak, this whole move down. But ultimately, this was that last monthly higher low within the equilibrium where we said, okay, well, if this EQ is gonna hold, then this is gonna be an anticipatory bull. You know, you can position low risk in here, and then you get a nice move up on Ape. So we'll we'll skip over sand just for, for time, but Sushi, you know, Sushi, relative strength on the way up. This is Sushi BTC, relative strength on the way up. Well, we knew we were looking for a two-day lower high we start to get a rising wedge. That's what makes this confirmed bull also an anticipatory bear. And then the bears won out on it. And this is the USD pairing. And the confirmed bear, Mana, you know, had been riding six hour 12 EMA the whole way down. And, you know, simple as that. You, you look bearish on a name you, that's EMA rider all the way down. So, and this is all while Bitcoin is just within its tightening range. So Bitcoin, we've got a six hour, you know, EQ essentially on it. <clears throat> and without even breaking out of its six hour EQ, we were able to have bull plays work out and bear plays work out because the ratio charts guided us 
to that. So to, to go in and actually look at these charts a little bit more. So here is that 8 BTC. We've got our EQ, high, low, lower high. We're looking for a higher low. That makes it an anticipatory bull. And we saw anticipatory bull follow through for a good while here. And that's 8 BTC. If we look at 8 USDT and, and look at that same thing, you know, this is one, it's a it's ratio divergence. You have your ratio holding the higher low while we while we broke to the lower low here, but ultimately ended up marking that bottom. And if we look at the percentage gains off there, 140%, 144% off of these ratio signals. So looking at LTC, this was our we need LTC BTC right here to look at our anticipatory or our confirmed bull on this. Got our move up, riding the 12 EMA. Here we are looking for the confirmed bull to keep bulling, and, and it did. It got great follow through for a good little bit there. And if we go back to LTC USDT, we can see great follow through from that. You position based on the ratio chart, but within your USD pairing, and then you get a nice move on up. So looking at sushi, that confirm or anticipatory bear. You know, it's holding on better than peers. It's got this strong bounce up, but certainly a lower high compared to that is the most likely scenario. You zoom in, you get your rising wedge. That tells you that, okay, this confirmed bull could be an anticipatory bear. Then you get the pull back on that. And if we look at Sushi USDT to see how that did as well, there's your move on up and there's your move on down there. So for the next one, mana confirmed bear or just riding the six hour 12 EMA down the whole way. You know, just the, these EMA riders are as simple as it gets in, in terms of uh, looking for a straightforward high probability play and got nice follow through. We look at mana USDT. Where are we? Here we are. You know, our confirmed bear ultimately, you know, pending how you manage your position ends up getting uh, almost 40% of further downside. Let's see here. And again, this is all while Bitcoin is just tightening on up sideways here. So when you can have LTC get that massive pop up to higher highs while Bitcoin goes to lower lows, that shows you the power of these ratio charts. And to have mana continue to bleed down almost 40% when Bitcoin only ends up going down 7%, you know, that shows you the power of these ratio charts. So uh, another example here for the high risk, high reward name, this is Sol when it was absolutely dumping. We've got our ratio chart on the right, we've got our USD pairing on the left, and it's getting absolutely smoked. But if you go for the high risk, high reward play of nailing the shift on the ratio chart, and it's, it was a bit tougher in this context because it was ultimately like a quarterly Wow, why does that look like that? Uh, ultimately, a quarterly higher low that we're looking for on everything because it's easier when you have your most likely scenario backing you up on it. And when it's a really large time frame, most likely scenario, it makes it tougher to peg it. But if you did, you were rewarded lavishly. Let's see here. You know, the USD pairing off of the lows ends up going up 240% off of that low. And then ultimately, we get another version of how to utilize these ratios here. Well, big move up, then we come all the way back down. Well, now we're testing support again. So you can look to position in Sol USD because Sol BTC is testing its support. Sol BTC holds its support. You get another really nice move up here on Sol USD. And then now we could see this as bearish ratio divergence. Sol B BTC is testing resistance. It's not through those highs. Sol USD is already through them. So that's ammo for a potential short play on Sol USD. There, there's so many ways you can slot into these different, um, you know, angles and and positions within these ratio charts. Do you want to be bold? Do you want to be bear? Do you want to be aggressive? Do you want to be conservative? You can go about it many many ways. So, in the last example we've got here is looking at our ratio charts and, and what they tell us about the underlying strength of our names. So we know we, we've been seeing some decent upside in the crypto space, um, and it was led by Bitcoin with the ETF stuff. 
but then we've seen rotation into alts and you know the alts that ended up getting the rotation they were the alts where the btc pairings were off of their lows so soul was one of those names that got that rotation link oh i mean the btc pairing link another one of these names that got the rotation you know it's it's ratio charts way off the low we're looking at the daily here aave another name that got part of the rotation it's way off of the lows and if we look around, let me pull up my ratio watch list. You know, if you go around and look at these other ratios, they were all down at the lows. We're now starting to see some of the rotation into the junkers, but this is what most of these ratio charts we're looking at. You can see AAV pops out like a sore thumb, very different. Soul pops out like a sore thumb, very different. All of these other guys just grinding the lows there. So that is that, that's it for the examples. Let's see, going for about an hour. Honestly, got through it quicker than I thought I would. Let's get back to the slides here. We'll do some QA. We'll turn the face cam back on. Um, one second, I gotta, I'm gonna shut my door real quick. I opened it so my cat could come in. He popped his head in, saw that there wasn't anything exciting and then ended up just ditching. We can see we got the sun setting, definitely a little bit darker in here. Cool, cool. Let's see what we got in the chat. If you got any questions, bomb them on in. Let's see. Chris Shermer, what's up, my man? Thanks for showing up. ER Berg, for when it's question time, what information can be gained on, say, ADA, ETH? Um... So I, I honestly don't use the ETH ratios within the space. I know some folks do, but I, I would say that it, it probably uh, performs pretty similar to the BTC ratios, but I, I can't speak with confidence on it uh, because I, I don't use them. But I, I don't know many traders that do use them, so I would encourage you to probably just focus on the BTC ratios. And as far as what you can do with those, hopefully that chat there with the confirmed bull anticipatory bear, confirmed bear anticipatory bull, that whole thing, you know, that should uh, answer with your question to what can we do with these things. So let's see what else we got. Sean, thanks for thanks for uh, coming to the webinar and thanks for the kind words. I'm glad you've you've found value in this series. Let's see from DC Irish. How do you spot higher lows for longs? What edge? That is, that's dialing back to ultimately the first two webinars, <clears throat> utilizing multiple time frame analysis and determining most likely scenarios. That's how you spot them. And then you use the info from the third webinar of your entry tools to get on in. So ultimately, if you're looking for a higher low, you want to bounce big enough that has created enough room for that higher low. And what that means is you bounced over the 50% retrace of your preceding move down. That tells you you got room for the higher low. And then you don't just YOLO in, you look for a pattern. You say, do I have an inverse head and shoulders? Do I have a falling wedge? Do I have a stair step? All of those things. And that's ultimately the whole shtick there. Let's see, what up, Tim? Thanks for coming, sir. Thanks for the kind words. Could you go over this morning's quad layout correlations and how you would classify RTY? It seemed uncorrelated for the first 30 minutes, but also could say it foreshadowed NQES, almost the opposite of last man standing, but rather first one diverging. So just a two minute chart on the first 30 to 60 minutes, if possible. Let's see, let me pull on over the quad layout. And we'll do it. It was, uh, you know, I was preparing for the webinar here today. So I didn't actually, I, I didn't even open up my brokers this morning because I know that if I have my brokers open, it's tough not to trade. If I'm in a trade, it's tough not to watch it. And I had to finish my prep for this. So we're going in blind here. So we're looking at first 30 minutes. Go to the two minute. So that would be to noon, or to, to 10, excuse me.
yeah, I mean, it's just it's just big time relative weakness. It's very clear. It's it's similar to that Tesla example of where we just had, um, you know, some names going up and some names straight up not participating at all. And as far as did this foreshadow what ended up coming in with here, you could say that, but there there will be plenty of times where we'll see NQ just carry the market up and, and uh, RTY ends up crap in the bed. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily say that this signal right here was the clear sign that, okay, we're going to end up getting this on NQ. What I would say is that if I'm looking to play bearish, I'm probably looking to play this RTY. Now, there's probably bigger gains on NQ, but this is a tougher move to get to get that move down than this move where we know we have relative weakness in our favor. And this is this kind of just goes into the whole balance of all of this stuff like, yes, uh, higher reward is great, but it comes at a higher risk and often comes with lower probabilities of success. So I would rather have an increased hit rate and maybe fewer gains by working with the correlations that are in my favor. Um, so that's sometimes, sometimes I like to try to, you know, peg the tops and bottoms and ultimately five minute stair step, you know, or two minute stair step ended up marking the top of the day. And this is why I love stair steps because it really was reasonable to get in on this NQ dump down, which ended up being, you know, decent, very decent move on down there. So, and then, you know, once the day went on, <clears throat> and this is where we can see clear relative strength. Let's see, here's our low of day. ES, new low of day. Low of day here, NQ, new low of day. RTY had new low of day very early. Well, look at YM. Look at where it bottomed. Let's, let's get a line. Low of day, double bottom. And then what happened the rest of the day? YM's your clear lead bull the rest of the day after that double bottom. Like ultimately, that's kind of a form of a last man standing play. RTY breaking it so early tells us that if we are looking bare, we're going to play that one. And ES and NQ a bit tougher to, to play here. All right. I think that's it for questions here at this point. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your night. Wait, let's see. I got a... I gotta thank you, Sly. Thank you for coming to the webinar. Thank you for checking out the full series. And we'll have to see what the next uh, round of webinars are gonna be. Let's see. Dan Wagme. Got another question rolling in. I have a quick unrelated question. How do you not miss a lower time frame stair step break, say two minute, when working out the position sizing of each consolidation candle? So a lot of that comes to, uh, with being familiar with the name that you're playing. I'll pull back up the chart here. Um, is this what I was? Yeah, we'll go over here. We'll pull up this. We'll go to NQ. Um, a, a lot of it comes to familiarity with the name you're playing. So, and this is part of the reason why I I play the same. Uh, eight names almost every day. It's going to be one of those eight names. ES, NQ, RTY, YM, gold, silver, oil, natural gas. Sometimes I'll dip into platinum, copper, and I'll dip into the grains, uh, beans, corn, and wheat. And, and that is the vast majority of my trading volume. Like I will swing trade stocks, but those are, are typically looser plays. Like my NVDA swing short that uh, I, I closed out way too early. Um, you know, I had gotten in on this day, uh, so we had to ride a little bit of red there, but it's a smaller position. You can kind of wiggle it on out. You don't have to be as precise with stuff. So I don't I don't do as much of that, uh, you know, fretting around with that stuff because they're, they're swing trades. But NQ, you know, if I'm playing a stair step, I just know in my head exactly how much risk there is for a certain number of points. And if I'm like, let's see here. So this is a low of 14,459 and a high of 14,76. So we're working with like 17 
points of risk at this point. So if it's if it's 17 points of risk, I know that I'm going to take X number of contracts, which is like half the number of contracts that I would take if it was 10 points risk. Um, so it's about being familiar. It's about being quick at math because it's not like you can't do it if you're not super familiar. Like we can, like, let's just go look at um, Apple. We'll do a hypothetical or let's find another good stair step. Who had a stair step similar? So MSFT. So I don't play MSFT. So I don't have my share size and this, that, and the other thing. But let's just say you want to risk roughly $100 on the trade. And we'll, and we'll kind of reverse engineer it here. So our stair step is there at 338.6. That's going to be our entry roughly. Our stop is going to be at 339.45. So we know that we've got you know, a little less than a dollar of risk. So simply, if you want to risk $100, then you know that you would just put on like 100 shares. And, and I don't, I'm not always trying to eke out the exact amount of risk. Like if I want to risk $100 on this trade, I would say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and just put on 100 shares and it'll be like $80 of risk. Um, and, and that's what I would do. I just kind of ballpark it with it. Like I prioritize easy math over like absolutely juicing out my um, my risk for any given thing. So if our if our candle was up here and we're looking at two dollars of risk and you want to risk only a hundred dollars, then you know you would be doing fifty shares. It's just getting comfortable with that quick math and it can feel daunting. But that the principle of it is the is the same. Uh, what's the distance to my stop, and how many shares can I put on to ultimately satisfy the dollar amount that I'm willing to risk? Hope that helps. Kalash, thank you, sir. Let's see, Marcelavas. It is. I definitely said that wrong, but thank you for the kind words. Thank you for showing up to the webinar, everybody. And let's see, we will officially wrap it up there on that. So thank you again. And if you if you want some more information about this, we've got a we've got an ebook. If you go to chartguys.com, which by the way, uh, Toby from the Chart Guys just finished making a super sweet website. I'm really uh, still pretty giddy about it going live. It went live last week. So if you haven't checked out the new website, definitely go there. Check that out, and um, if you go in there in the resources, there's an ebook guide, and there's an ebook that I wrote probably about a year ago on correlations. Um, so you can sign up and get that ebook, and it should be helpful to help uh, solidify some of this stuff. Let's see, follow up from Dan. Right on. Glad you found it helpful. It's it's definitely a, a, a tougher game in crypto, especially when you're trading like the poop coins where you like the price of it is 0 0.0078 or whatever. It can be a lot more difficult to do the math, but I would certainly, um, you know, you can kind of make yourself like a, a chart or something where you say like, okay, a, a tenth of a penny risk on whatever this coin is, I can, I can take 10,000 coins and that will be within my risk tolerance. You can, you can kind of do a little bit of the math ahead of time and then you just like, you know, know that you're above it or below it. And ultimately we just want to know where our max risk threshold is. And then anything that's slightly below that is, is fine. Let's see. Yes. The previous uh, webinars are still on YouTube and they're in that lessons and more category there. And, and you know maybe we will do a separate playlist just for these four now that they're now that they're done. But uh, Goatman Dan will be the decider on that. All right. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your night. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you for all the kind words and support. And I will 